Welcome to all the visitors. I'm, I'm introducing a beef who will introduce Ryan. Uh, but I want to say something briefly about Ryan. So in January of 2014, so just last year, uh, my wife, who I think is somewhere in this audience, um, her, her PI in neuroscience at Harvard reached out to Ryan Adams to see if he wouldn't mind counseling a theoretical math postdoc at MIT who was looking for ways to collaborate on research with uh, non-zero probability of real world impact before he was dead. Um, and, and Ryan not only immediately reached out, you know, met with me for an hour one-on-one, -on -one, gave me great advice, invited me to his group meetings, he even put me on the Slack channel for his group, and that's like a big, a big thing, I think. Uh, but, you know, and, and it, was, it was just really generous and wonderful, and, and now when I have a question, he's kind of busier, so I just call his podcast and and he answers it as a listening, listener question, which is what happened this week. <laughs> so, if you go to Talking Machines and you listen to the latest episode, around 10 minutes in, you'll hear me asking a question and you'll hear his answer. Um, his students reflect that same generosity, and six of them have come to grow this, this term, or, or will be, uh, to share their, their beautiful ideas with us around machine learning in a seminar that is on Mondays in the Nanoc at 1 p.m., and it's filling the room. Uh, and if anything, I've, I've become paranoid that Ryan thinks that I'm trying to, to kidnap all the students at Pipette Point um, and force them to, to cure all the diseases with us. Uh, and there might be some truth to that. So, to give Ryan a proper introduction, it's my pleasure to turn it over to another generous mentor and admirable uh, and inspiring computational biologist who has recently become chair of the faculty of you. Okay, so that was the introduction to the introduction. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to keep this very short for two reasons. First of all, because John already did most of the introduction, and also because I think uh, many of you, especially those who come from the machine learning community, and also a lot of the people, the computational biologists in the road, already know Ryan, and I think John needs so many of the critical notes. But it's also clear to me from seeing the faces in the audience that there are additional members of our community who came to this talk who probably know less about Ryan and less about this field and might not actually know which podcast John was even referring to. And that's a great thing. That's actually what we were hoping uh, to see here today. So Ryan is a world leader in this field and not only is he at Harvard, although he's apparently only me from Harvard at the moment, um, he also ended up uh, starting a startup and then getting acquired by Twitter, and he's now uh, the head of uh, research at Twitter Cortex, which is the part of Twitter that um, is invested in learning um, models, I think, of what is actually going on in Twitter when all of us, or those of us who do tweets, tweet. Um, this has actually been quite noticed and made a lot of headlines because it is another signal of the way in which information doesn't just get out there, but it's also processed and used and reused in many different ways to tell us about what is going on. I think this is something that biologists, especially in genomics, have recognized for many years, but with every you know, turn of the technology wheel, every new scale that we achieve in genomics, the problem re-manifests itself. The things that worked before no longer work because the scale is not right, because they're not engineered in the right way, or because there are new biological questions that we can ask if we only had the right analytics. And not only that, there might be computer, biological questions that we would not even ask if we look at the system through the eyes of the biologist, but we would ask them, and they would be deeply biologically meaningful if we came from with the eyes of a different field. And I think Ryan really epitomizes the importance of having depth and rigor in a field external to biology, but passion and commitment both to the questions that biology poses and to the type of social interactions that you have to do in an effective collaboration to make all of that happen. And that really turns me to, to the second aspect. Ryan has a unique talent and passion to taking complex things and making them readily understood by people who might not share the first, first, the same first language as he, and I think we're going to see a beautiful demonstration of this in the talk today. And in particular, he has this highly popular podcast called Talking Machines that I think has tens of thousands of listeners, which, considering the target population, is a remarkably huge number, and um, where he discusses many things in machine learning, but repeatedly there are questions that 
um, show how machine learning is brought to bear in biology. They've talked about how you make CRISPR more efficient. They've talked about finding clusters in cancers, correcting for confounders in genome-wide association studies, and even things that I happen to work on, like modeling cellular activity over time. And so I think the podcast is a, is a great listening experience. It's a great learning experience, whether you're an expert or a novice to the field. But of course, there's nothing like the original in person, which is our great pleasure today. And so, uh, Ryan, we all very much look forward to your talk. And thank you for taking time. Thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> this is an, an incredible honor, and, and I, I'm, I'm very overwhelmed, to be honest, and, and uh, particularly because I should say that I am, I am not a biologist, just to be totally clear. I'm a machine learning researcher, and to make it sort of additionally clear how much I'm not a, uh, a biologist, I've taken precisely one sort of college-level biology course. Um, that was 7012 at, at MIT here. Uh, taught by Professor Eric Lander, who gave me a C, and uh, <laughs> uh, and I, a C I deserved, I think. <laughs> um, and so, I, I so so what I'm going to do is occasionally probably be naive about about uh, about different things in life sciences, but tell you about I can uh, kind of um, how I think we might think more broadly than we often do about uh, the relationship between machine learning and biology. So machine learning uh, uh, fundamentally is about the, the idea of trying to sort of imbue algorithms with the ability to learn from experience where experience is broadly defined. Uh, that is to adapt to data and to uh, you know, use data to inform sort of better decision making, predictions, and identifying structure, uh, sort of structure in data to, uh, to these ends. And I really like to think of machine learning as being a kind of, uh, a kind of paradigm for programming that is not so unfamiliar from, from other ways that we do programming. So uh, a typical kind of way that you might produce a program uh, to, you know, or, or pro have a computer achieve some task is to sit down and think hard about the ways that, uh, that inputs might map to outputs and to then write a program that you hand to the computer that does this. And machine learning is a kind of a, a different way of thinking about what it means to program computers in which we provide input output examples and then, uh, and then ask the computer to produce for us a program uh, that hopefully will be able to generalize that to, uh, to inputs that it has never seen before and produce outputs that are, that are consistent with this. At some level, the way we do this is by applying tools that are very old from statistics, and uh, you can really kind of think of machine learning in some sense as being uh, a kind of coupling of statistics and, uh, and computer science. And uh, of course, that, that's only kind of the biggest piece of it, but it's been influenced by a, lot of, by a lot of other areas. In particular, it sort of grew out of the area of artificial intelligence, but it also touches on things like neuroscience and optimization and signal processing in many other areas. And the main difference, in a sense, between machine learning and, uh, and statistics is really kind of ultimately one of taste. Uh, machine learning, in machine learning, we tend to care about things like prediction. Uh, we care about sort of computational complexity, as is understood in theoretical computer science. And we often care about sort of building systems that are going to achieve interesting scalability. And this is a little bit in contrast to a cartoon of, of, of a statistical kind of taste in which, we, uh, in which statisticians tend to care more about evaluating hypotheses, identifiability and parameters, and, uh, and properties of estimators like, like bias and variance. So machine learning has, been, uh, has kind of really risen into prominence in a lot of ways in the last couple of years. It's uh, impacting our lives in ways that, that we see and that we don't see uh, in, in a lot of different kinds of ways, whether it's uh, Siri, you know, uh, voice recognition, and, uh, or recommendations on Netflix, or question answering, or some uh, eventual self-driving cars, and, and lots of other things. The point is that machine learning is, is sort of impacting us in, in kind of lots of different exciting ways, and I think, I think we're on track to see even more impact. Um, it, but for me, it's a very, very exciting time because as uh, somebody who sort of likes to think broadly about things we might be able to do with these tools, um, I'm very lucky to have a, a research group that, uh, that sort of shares this breadth and allows us to touch a lot of different, a lot of different areas. So whether we're uh, you know, applying machine learning ideas in, in neuroscience or in astronomy or in chemistry uh, or modeling the, uh, modeling the NBA, uh, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time to be a methodological researcher. You get to touch a lot of different areas and think about a lot of different things. And biology is perhaps one of the most exciting areas uh, for this interface. 
And, and this is because, uh, I, I think broadly, uh, because of this, this, uh, this kind of view on machine learning that I generally attribute to, to Andrew Ng, which is essentially that you can think of machine learning algorithms and scalable machine learning algorithms as kind of like building a big rocket, right? And you know, we build big rock rockets because we want to go someplace. We want to learn something. We want to achieve some new sort of scientific frontier. And, but building a big rocket by itself, building big scalable machine learning algorithms is, is sort of only interesting to the extent that it consume, can sort of consume a lot of rocket fuel to get us where we want to go. That is to, uh, to consume data and produce new answers, but also for to have a destination, right? To have a place that, that we really want to head. And I think biology is, is sort of very exciting because of the ways that it is both invested in uh, it is both invested in sort of automation and scalability and, and really asking deep data-driven sort of empirical questions about the way these systems work, about the, uh, the willingness to, to build big and complicated models that are, that, uh, you know, that are evaluated and justified by our increasing understanding of complicated, uh, complicated biological systems. Uh, and, and, so, and, and at the same time, you know, I, I know that this is important because uh, when I look around me and I look at, at the, the sort of, uh, you know, my, my colleagues in machine learning and computer science and, and I, I sort of look at some of the, the very smartest people and the biggest methodological contributors in these areas, they are often incredibly motivated by, by biological problems and they, in a sense, treat themselves as biologists first and methodological researchers second. And, and this kind of deep engagement with biological problems is, uh, I mean, I, I think it's, is kind of reflects the, the nature of both of these fields uh, as, as kind of a, it being a very exciting time. But what I want to do is not actually even talk about using machine learning for data analysis and biology. I bet the room is full of people who do this, and I would only embarrass myself by trying to somehow enumerate the different ways that this, is, uh, that this has, had, has had impact and will continue to have impact. Instead, I want to do something a little bit different, um, and I, I want to talk about, uh, about kind of other potential interface points between uh, machine learning and, uh, and the life sciences. And that's not to say that scalable data analysis is, is anything other than incredibly important and necessary, but let's talk, let's talk about some different things today. I'm going to sort of tell you about two different things I have in mind. Um, one of them is thinking about how we might uh, sort of use machine learning to perform design in biological spaces. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this, and then also talk about a kind of case study of a collaboration outside of biology, but that hopefully is kind of familiar to people in the room. And then I'll talk about another kind of idea, which is thinking about how the fundamental principles that we learn from biology, I mean, sorry, that we learn from machine learning might, uh, might inform synthetic biology, and thinking about information processing in both, engineering, uh, both engineered and natural systems. Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and let's start out by thinking about design. Okay, so what do I mean by design? And in, in particular, what do I mean by like automated design? Well, really this, this kind of comes down to the idea of optimization, broadly speaking. There's some, uh, maybe we want to come up with a new drug or we want to identify a new DNA sequence or molecule or we want to tune uh, the parameters of some large system. In all of these cases, we're faced with a problem of trying to find the best or trying to find a set of candidates. Or maybe we want to design an experiment to gather uh, as much information as possible. Uh, and in all of these cases, what we're essentially doing and what we'd like to be able to do is to identify structure in data, structure in the problem that we're examining. And instead of just using that in a post hoc way to assess hypotheses, say, uh, to actually use it to make better decisions, to close the loop with, uh, you know, with experimentalists and to actually uh, identify structure, use that to design new sort of uh, new hypotheses, design new sort of objects and then evaluate those. A lot of these are very old ideas. Experimental design is not a machine learning concept. It goes back, you know, to, we're talking sort of uh, R.A. Fisher. This is a very old idea and it in many ways derived from biology. But I feel like it's something that we need to have instead of sort of, uh, in the backs of our minds, it's something that we need to have kind of in the front of our minds. We're thinking about the interface between ML and the life sciences. So I thought I would give you a kind of particular example to highlight kind of what I mean, like what would learning structure and using it to make decisions as part of design, uh, what would that look like? Um, and I'm gonna tell you about uh, an idea called Bayesian optimization uh, that we've been thinking about for the last several years and that several people in the room, uh, like Jasper Snook and Hugo La Rochelle have, have also been, ha have been collaborating on. And the, uh, the big picture here is to think about how we can optimize very expensive functions, 
And probably, whether you realize it or not, you spend a lot of your days optimizing very expensive functions as you evaluate the space of different uh, maybe assays that you might want to run, or you tune some, uh, some algorithm that you're, going to, that you're going to apply. So you can think about different kinds of spaces where this, where this exists. So you might be trying to come up with an optimal design, for example, for some, uh, for some turbine blade. And there's a parametric space. There's a space of possible turbine blades you can consider. Evaluating one of these uh, might involve running a bunch of computational fluid dynamics simulations that might take you know, days or weeks, and then eventually maybe even building a turbine and evaluating how it performs under some workload in, in the real world. You could imagine things like trying to run uh, climate simulations on supercomputers where you're trying to fit these things to data to make them as realistic as possible, but again, it, tr it requires a tremendous amount of resources to even evaluate one point in this design space. Uh, there's some uh, biomimetic roboticists in the mechanical engineering department at, uh, at MIT, Song Bae Kim and his, and his students, and they build these like amazing cheetah robots, and the controllers and the design of these, of these robots is very hard to reason about. You can evaluate them in simulation, and what you'd like to be able to do is design in this space in a kind of an automatic way. And then the thing that we focus a lot of our energy on uh, in my group has been thinking about how we can tune other large-scale machine learning systems for things like uh, visual object recognition, okay? So big, deep learning systems that you may have heard about to you know, recognize faces and things like that may take, may take days or weeks to train, and you want to make very intelligent decisions about the metaparameters in those systems. And this is what our startup was founded, uh, founded to commercialize. So I thought I'd just give you a little bit of the flavor of like what I mean when I talk about trying to find structure and data and then use that to make great decisions. And this is gonna be a kind of a cartoon of the Bayesian optimization story, just to make it clear kind of what I have in mind. So what we're gonna to try to do here is we're gonna think about how to minimize uh, a function uh, here. We're gonna, there's some function we don't know that is this dotted line here, and we're gonna to try to find the minimum, which is over, uh, over there on sort of like negative 3.7 or something like that. And um, this is a cartoon, but the point is that we can only evaluate this function point-wise. We don't have some simple sort of like functional form for it. And maybe it's, so maybe it's very expensive. Like when we evaluate one of those points, maybe it takes a week or something to, to consider. And we've seen three evaluations already. And the idea of Bayesian optimization is to try to use all of that information to build a model of the world and to reason about that model to make a great decision on what we're gonna try next, okay? And the reason this is kind of hard and interesting, but also possible, is because we can think about performing, for example, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian inference in this space. And this boils down to the fact that if we have a space of functions that we care about, then there's some posterior distribution given those data. These are, these are sort of possible functions that would be consistent with those data, um, but of course we don't know exactly which one it is. And so when we think about using structure to make good decisions, what we're talking about is trying to reason about uh, decisions we might make that would be good under kind of, on average, under all these possible functions. Okay, and this is kind of what the Bayesian optimization story is specifically. The, uh, what's kind of nice is that often in the Bayesian non-parametric context, we can use objects like a Gaussian process to instead of reasoning about functions, reason about distributions over functions, and in particular the marginal distributions of what might happen at some place we haven't yet, we haven't yet looked. A uh, Gaussian process is a very nice kind of a, a Bayesian nonlinear regression model that allows us to construct these kind of intervals without, uh, without reference to a particular finite basis. So back to the optimization, the question is, what should we do next? What should the fourth point be to evaluate, and we have some current best, our kind of incumbent best, which is this, uh, this point that the blue line goes through. And, what's, and the kind of the broad idea here when I talk about automating design might be to try to come up with a utility function that allows us to reason over the quality of the next design we will try. So the next point, in this case, on this x-axis. And uh, a very nice way to think about that, there's a few different nice ways, but one way is to think about the expected improvement in that design over our current, over our current best. And this is just the expectation of the kind of tail of this distribution beneath uh, the straight blue line. And it gives us another function, that looks like this along the bottom, where bigger is better. And we can now maximize that function to make a great decision about where to go next. The trick is, that thing's cheap. It's a property of the model. It's a property of the structure we've identified in this posterior distribution, right? So we can optimize that guy super cheaply and then make a really great decision about where to go next. And then we can go off and run that experiment or, or uh, evaluate that molecule or synthesize that DNA sequence. 
and then we can perform a posterior update, account for the information we gathered when we got that, when we got that observation, and again, complete this loop. Go back, evaluate a new utility function uh, that accounts for the uncertainty, but also with the new information we just gathered, and can make a great decision about what to, what to try in the next iteration. And we can run this process and gradually learn about the structure in the data, but in particular as it relates to the best examples. So this is a global optimization procedure that is building a model and then, and then using that model and then closing the loop. So this is kind of an example. This is not the only sort of way to think about these kinds of problems, but it's one way, and it's the way that in, in my group we often like to, like to think about it. Um, and this is kind of what I mean by, by, by sort of automating design with structure. And the question is how broadly can we think about what kinds of objects can be optimized in this way? Like I said, we focus a lot on algorithmic uh, ideas, but we also have, a we have had a nascent collaboration with folks at the Broad to use this kind of idea to design DNA sequences for particular binding affinities. For example, we're synthesizing and then sequencing these things you know, is, is, has some non-trivial expense. More broadly though, what I thought I would do is kind of give you a flavor of what a sort of collaboration using this kind of tool might look like. Right? So this is not gonna be about biology, but hopefully this sort of process will be interestingly familiar to people here. And the process I'm gonna tell you about, the collaboration I'm gonna tell you about is uh, one in which we're trying to design new organic materials. Okay, so uh, again, there are students in the room like, uh, like uh, Dougal McLaurin who are sort of heavily into this and, uh, and have actually been doing all the work that I'm just about to tell you about. And the, the sort of the big picture is, uh, for example, when we have like solar cells now or, or, uh, or television screens, these are essentially made from sort of silicon materials. Uh, so rigid materials that might be expensive to produce and for, in the case of solar cells are heavy and rigid and you can't sort of put them anywhere you want. Maybe they're not very envi environmentally friendly. And ultimately it takes something like two years for a solar cell to recover the amount of energy it took, it took to create. In principle, we could make these things essentially out of plastic, right? We could have them be sort of uh, made cheaply, put them everywhere, make them moldable and transparent and lots of great properties. Uh, but, and there are various technical reasons why, that hard, why that's hard, but one of the big ones is we actually don't know of any organic molecules that are really competitive with their silicon counterparts. So we, act, so we actually don't, have, we don't know what the right molecules are. But the, there's not really any sort of like theoretical barriers to such molecules. We just, we just literally don't know what they are and the space is very, very large, okay? So the space of possible molecules that might have interesting properties is enormous. And so the name of the game and, the, and, the, and, and what this collaboration is about is trying to, to develop methods uh, with chemists, so with Alanis Peruguzic and, and his group and, at the Harvard Chemistry Department to automate this process, to automate this design of novel materials. So let me give you kind of an idea of what this looks like. And, and what I hope is that you can imagine the sort of, uh, sort of interesting analogs that might go on in this building. And the, uh, so this process of, of sort of computational discovery as it's been going on in, in Alon's group sort of looks like this. We, have, we start out with a very large number of candidate molecules in a database. These are basically generated combinatorially. Then there's some set of rules that are applied to blacklist ones that are undesirable for, uh, for various reasons that chemists understand and I don't. And, the, uh, and then ultimately the ones that are left are gradually pumped through uh, a density functional theory simulation essentially to try to assess what uh, say the efficiency would be if this was a photovoltaic or what like how bright it would be if it was an LED. This is expensive because evaluating one of these molecules might take sort of like hours or days and then ultimately the best ones are looked at by humans and they pick them out based on taste or intellectual property or whatever reasons uh, that they like one molecule over another. And then ultimately these are synthesized. Synthesis often fails, it's expensive, it takes, you know, it might take months and tens of thousands of dollars. Some of those get ultimately synthesized and are interesting and then they need to be put into devices to actually use them. Uh, that can fail for a variety of reasons because the device space has its own sort of interesting uh, sort of parametric properties. And then hopefully at the end of this very long pipeline, you wind up with, an, with uh, you know, a device that's actually useful and viable for the purpose you set out uh, to achieve, okay? So the question is how can we collaborate with these chemists to try to inject machine learning into this process in interesting ways uh, in order to accelerate it and to, get better, and to get better molecules out of the end of that very, very deep funnel. <laughs> 
And we've had a lot of different, we have a lot of different ideas on how to do this. Almost all of these are very speculative. Um, but you can imagine, for example, rather than combinatorial generation um, uh, of, of candidate molecules, thinking hard about the search space and about search algorithms uh, that sort of arise from computer science. Uh, you could imagine using supervised learning to try to classify, uh, to classify into sort of uh, whitelist and blacklist type molecules based on examples rather than based on fixed human rules. You could imagine using ideas like active learning and supervised learning to try to predict the output of what density functional theory would give you rather than actually running it on all of these molecules first. You could imagine trying to use, uh, to use knowledge of the synthetic space to suggest possible routes to, to, uh, to people who are attempting to synthesize the molecules. We're not to the point where we can really automate much of the synthesis process after that routing yet, but uh, people in this building are interested in that with microfluidics and things. Um, and then ultimately we, need to, we can enable a search process again at the device scale, and hopefully what we wind up with are better materials faster out of the bottom of this big funnel, all right? So the thing we've had sort of uh, an interesting amount of success with, success with has been this particular aspect of it. So this density functional theory computation is very slow, it's very expensive, and the way that they've been doing it has essentially been to chug through this big database one at a time in more or less a random order. But if we have good supervised learning uh, sort of machines that can produce an estimate of what DFT will tell us after sort of milliseconds rather than days, then we can order those and look at the best candidates much faster. We still run DFT on the best ones, but, uh, but we can make much better decisions about it. And this is something we've really been doing and there's uh, sort of manuscript in preparation. And in effect, we've seen sort of tenfold improvements in, uh, in evaluating these kinds, of, these kinds of molecules. And they've led to actual interesting uh, uh, sort of intellectual property and interesting new devices that we hope to eventually see. So I showed you this slide before about the, the relationship between sort of traditional programming and, and machine learning. So here we can think about this as sort of traditional computational chemistry, which is not fair, by the way, because uh, Alon's group represents kind of the state of the art. There's nothing traditional about it. They're incredibly good at what they do. Um, and um, and so, so this is like, so the way they do it is already incredibly sophisticated. Um, but the process that they essentially have is to try to build a box. In this case, the box is density functional theory that takes, uh, that takes a molecule and then produces sort of figures of merit that you care about for these kinds of things. And the dream with machine learning based design is to create a different box in which what we do is we give it examples of molecules and their efficiencies, and then it actually gives us new molecules that, that, were, not in the, that were not in the training set and that perhaps no human has, has written down before. And right now we're screening very large sets to get to that point, but we're also making progress on actually sort of, uh, sort of synthesizing completely novel, uh, uh, novel molecules. So this is kind of the, the dream. But one of the things that we always try to keep in mind, and one of the challenges of this kind of collaboration, is that on one hand, we have a lot of fun, we try to learn a lot of chemistry, and we, we try to really dig deep into the science, which is of course the only way that you can proceed. But also as computer scientists, we wanna make sure that we're still doing interesting computer science. And that induces us to sort of peel back the hood in, in, in fun ways on different ways that, uh, that like cheminformaticists might have developed representations for these kinds of, uh, for these kinds of, of, of objects. So in the case of molecules, what we, we, we spent some time exploring different ways that, um, that cheminformaticists sort of build representations. Uh, one of the ones that we've had a lot, we had a lot of success with was something called a, uh, a Morgan circular fingerprint. And this basically takes some kind of molecular graph and then, uh, and its goal is to produce a binary representation of fixed length that you could hand to your Gaussian process or your, uh, or your deep neural network or whatever it is. And the way it does this is essentially by um, applying a sequence of, of hash functions at every layer of uh, sort, of, uh, sort of applying a hash function locally on the molecular graph and then repeatedly applying it uh, layer by layer and then at the end sort of taking, uh, taking the modulo of the bit vector length and turning that bit on. Okay, and that sounds crazy and it is a little bit crazy but it also works surprisingly well and this is because within a particular data set, if a bit is on, then probably within two, within two molecules, then probably they have some interesting shared substructure. I mean, that's kind of, the, kind of what this is after. But if you squint your eyes, if you're a machine learning re researcher and you look at that, it looks a lot like something called a convolutional neural network, which is an incredibly successful uh, sort of neural network architecture for things like speech recognition and, uh, and like visual object recognition, taking advantage of, of interesting topologies of the objects you're trying to classify. 
And so what, uh, what David and Dougal did is they, they sort of unrolled, they kind of unrolled the classic circular fingerprints that have been, again, been very successful. They're built into tools like RDKit and, and, and so on. And they looked at opportunities to replace things like hash functions with, uh, with essentially differentiable and parameterized smooth functions. And then, uh, and then built an automatic differentiation package around that, which has been its own interesting thing. But this is an example, and, and, uh, um, and what this lets them do is now back propagate essentially in, into this object and learn the parameters of such a hash function. And so this is kind of an example, I feel like, of interesting work where uh, you're finding the, the novel computer science, the novel methodology uh, that generalizes to other things, whether it's automatic differentiation or replacing sort of discrete hash functions with differentiable, uh, with differentiable objects that lets us do interesting chemistry and collaborate, but also feel like we're, we're able to speak to our computer science peers about what we're doing. And I feel like this is a really fundamental element of any successful collaboration uh, in this kind of space. It also has a nice property that gives better predictions. Uh, and, and so on, on different kinds of problems, we can, we can sort of make better predictions about the photovoltaic efficiency relative to existing methods. It also has the nice property that when we go back to our chemistry colleagues and we, and we talk to them uh, about what this neural network seems to have learned, um, then they can help us understand uh, the sort of the features that it's discovered. So for example, if you, if you do this kind of thing and apply it to the question of whether a molecule is going to be soluble or not, then you get structures that, that sort of seem intuitively familiar, right? So uh, you, you know, having these aromatic rings, uh, these things tend to not be soluble, but if you have sort of asymmetric charges, then maybe, maybe you are soluble. And similarly with, uh, with things like toxicity. So this is just kind of an example of what I mean by a collaboration to, to have ML-driven design, where there's a big, deep pipeline, and the, you know, the chemists need to learn about computer science and learn about the, the way that sort of we're thinking about the world, and we need to take a deep dive into, into the fundamental questions that they want to answer in service of that science. Um, and, and I think there's huge opportunities for this in a variety of domains. And so, um, and I really feel like this is an example of something that gets beyond sort of data analysis. It's beyond like run a fancy regression on my, you know, on my uh, microarray or whatever. So the, uh, so that's one thing that I feel like is kind of beyond data analysis. And then the, the second thing that I want to tell you about is, is more on the sort of synthetic biology side of things. And it's much more speculative, but also is a little bit, this can be a little bit more technical. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is think about information processing uh, in biomolecular systems. Okay, so they're trying to get at kind of two questions. And I'm going to give you one particular attack on this that is kind of fun, uh, if not all that realistic. So the questions are how can we, so the two questions we're kind of getting after are how can we build machine learning algorithms into synthetic biological systems? And then similarly, how can we use the, the primitives that machine learning identifies for, ad, for adaptive algorithms? How can we perhaps interpret some of the interesting computations that are going on in natural systems with these tools? So synthetic biology will be the kind of the angle that we're going to come at uh, from this. It's, you know, synthetic biology is the, the sort of the enterprise of trying to uh, apply engineering principles to design, uh, you know, to, to achieve particular sort of uh, essentially kind of nanorobots made out of biomolecules. Uh, a lot of this involves what, is amount, what amounts to sort of mechanical engineering at this tiny scale, uh, developing three-dimensional structures and, uh, and actuators, um, as well as of course, trying to assemble them together in larger systems that achieve particular purposes. Any kind of system like this, so necessarily, is also going to need some kind of interesting brain in it. We, our macro scale robots have mechanical engineering aspects and also have intelligent algorithms uh, sort of living inside them that allows them to do things. Nano scale robots are going to need the same, are going to need the same thing. And so there is this world of thinking about biomolecular computing, uh, whether it's sort of logic gates or simple classifiers and, and so on. And more generally, people also think about how to do molecular programming, like how do we, um, you know, how do we come up with abstractions that are familiar from the macro scale sort of digital world, uh, and how do you implement those in, uh, you know, biomolecular systems. But what I want to sort of tell you about today, at first I, what I want to say is that I feel like one of the things we're really going to need in these systems for them to succeed is, is some kind of inference. Essentially, a lot of the problems that, that we try to solve at macro scale, but will also arise at, at sort of these tiny scales, 
is one of sensor fusion dealing with noisy data and trying to come up with, uh, with associated uncertainty estimates for the state of the world, where the state of the world in this case is sort of the tiny world. And, uh, and it's true that Turing complete abstractions, like I showed you on the previous slide, you know, we can program those in the same way I can write like a dynamic programming algorithm on my laptop. But what I want to tell you about is a particular way to set up some biomolecular systems that does this in a surprisingly painless way. That it turns out, basically, that you can do uh, an, an, in an interesting flavor of statistical inference with probabilistic graphical models in chemistry, so using essentially mass action kinetics. And, um, and, it, and it turns out to sort of be surprisingly easy and sort of concentrations, in a sense, want to be probabilities. And, and this is basically because uh, and when we implement Probab you know, probabilistic computation on our, uh, our sort of macro scale computers, we spend a ton of time making sure that these numbers are non-negative and sum to one. Like that's like the name of the game whenever you're implementing uh, machine learning algorithms. Concentrations, you get that for free, right? So concentrations can't be negative. And if you have conservation of mass, then they sum to one. And they, so they really sort of want to implement, uh, uh, sort of they kind of want to implement probabilities already. And it turns out that with a relatively mod surprisingly modest set of, of reactions, you can implement inference in a probabilistic graphical model. So probabilistic graphical models, and Nir Friedman is here somewhere, so, uh, and so he's like one of the, the giant names in this, in this area, uh, co-authored one of the sort of <laughs> perhaps the most important book uh, in this space. And, uh, but, but they infiltrate tons of different areas. And this is slide is just meant to make the case that these are important. They're important and practical and useful in a lot of different domains. Um, whether speech recognition or uh, the error correcting code that's built into your phone or whatever it is, these things are everywhere at macro scales. And so it's reasonable to think, well, are we, you know, let's apply some of the same engineering principles at these tiny biomolecular scales. And so what I'm gonna tell you about is essentially a way uh, to compile a particular, uh, essentially a way to compile a particular version of probabilistic graphical models called the factor graph into chemical reaction networks. All right, and, and so literally a soup that as it settles to steady state will perform inference for you, okay? And the reason that's an interesting abstraction is because uh, other people have, have sort of found out that there are nice ways to take uh, arbitrary chemical reaction networks and, uh, and approximate them sort of as well as you want to with like DNA strand uh, displacement cascades. So it's like Eric Winfrey and colleagues um, and so it's kind of a fun thing to think about uh, as a way that, you know, I'm not going to tell you about any actual experiments. This is all going to be in simulation and sort of, and, and, and sort of math. But, the, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's a fun thing to think about as, you know, as chemical reaction networks are something we might actually be able to, uh, to build. And, um, and so let me tell you about this, this sort of compilation. And it's going to be a little bit annoying in some ways because I'm going to have to, I'm going to tell you about probabilistic graphical models at a very high level. And then I'm also gonna have to tell you about mass action kinetics, and then we're gonna try to merge these notations into one thing. Um, so bear with me a little bit. So this is Yuta Pearl, who is sort of uh, the godfather, or perhaps one of the godfathers of, of, uh, of graphical models. The, the sort of the big picture for probabilistic graphical models as a formalism for machine learning is that what we're trying to do is to couple observed data in the world with unobserved things that we wanna estimate. Okay, so we can, we can cook up structure that we think exists, and we try to write down a joint probability distribution between unobserved stuff and observed stuff. And the idea is that if we knew what the unobserved stuff was, that would be useful for our sort of scientific purposes or estimation or prediction or whatever. This is challenging because writing down a big joint distribution can be, can be hard. You have to think hard, do some modeling, and so on. Probabilistic graphical models are a sort of a nice way to uh, are a nice way to think about it because it allows you to marry probability theory with uh, uh, with graph theory and then think about dependencies between different random variables in your model in terms of essentially edges in a graph. And so it's a very very successful paradigm for building these kinds of probabilistic graphical models. And the name of the game is ultimately to then build such a graphical model, build such a joint distribution, condition on the data out in the world, and then, and then sort of interrogate the resulting posterior distribution to ask whatever questions you want to ask about the structure of your data. It also has a very nice sort of uh, property that you can, uh, that a lot of the computations you'd like to do uh, with these probabilities can be, are sort of made easier by the structure of the graph and that message passing algorithms, so things that are sort of passing, uh, passing vectors along on the edges of the graph, uh, 
can often result in very efficient, sort of give you very efficient computation. And this is precisely what we're going to take advantage of to, to come up with, uh, with chemical reaction networks. So here's uh, the formalism in particular that we're going to use. It's called a factor graph. And the idea is that we have a collection of random variables. The random variables are going to be circles. And they're going to be discrete for now. And then we have squares. The squares are, are factors. And what they're really, they're kind of compatibility functions, essentially, between the, uh, between the random variables that they connect to. And the idea, essentially, is that we're specifying the structure of a particular, uh, of a particular big joint distribution over, over these guys. And it's very familiar. If you've heard of like icing models and things like that, this is not interestingly different. These are essentially potential functions. And then there's some, uh, there's some partition function uh, that we compute to normalize this into a big, uh, a big probability mass function. So why is this interesting and relevant for any kind of biological questions? Here's the most cartoonish version possible, but I hope might trigger your imagination. Uh, this is what a computer scientist thinks goes on in cells. The, uh, uh, but here's a kind of inference task for the homunculus kind of that lives inside a cell. And the, uh, you know, there's some question about whether or not there's a protein living outside the cell. Is it, is it protein A or protein B? It has some interesting sort of binding sites. There's some membrane proteins that you know, change their configuration and maybe catalyze something interesting on the inside uh, when you get a binding. But the world is noisy. There's lots of different types. They overlap, and the thing can be oriented in different ways, and who knows? Uh, it's a big, noisy world. And the question is, how do you, you know, sort of how can the inside of the cell reason about uh, the uncertainty associated with what's actually going on outside? And so ideally, if you sort of want to think about optimality, and evolution seems to like optimality, then this is going to be somehow consistent with conditional probability. And so there's some late variables we want to estimate. So what the identity here of the protein is is hidden from us. We put a prior on it. There's a likelihood function, uh, essentially, that is the noisy process of generating these kind of uh, you know, affecting chemical reactions going on inside the cell. And what we'd like to do is reason about the posture distribution uh, over that hidden state, given what we can see, integrating out noise like due to binding uncertainty and so on. And so we could build a probabilistic graphical model in which there are variables that are the things we'd like to estimate that are coupled together with a prior, as well as the kind of the observations here that, uh, that give us information about which of these states uh, exists. Okay, so this is, again, a cartoon to explain why this might be an interesting kind of th paradigm for reasoning about uh, uncertainty. The classic example, just to give you an idea of why sort of building such a graph is interesting, is, uh, is something like a hidden Markov model, which is incredibly influential uh, in sequence modeling uh, for things like DNA. And, uh, and the sort of the name of the game when we use these kinds, of, these kinds of graphical models is we'd like to perform marginalization. So that's summing up the things we don't care about to perform a, a sort of a particular estimation, perhaps conditioning on some stuff we can see. In general, this is very hard because sums are hard. This is kind of like computing the partition function of this big thing. But if the graph has sufficient structure, then it turns out that we can break the problem into subparts. Okay, in particular, if we were going to focus on one piece of this and estimate something like Z4, then you get to solve a problem on the left, and you get to solve a separate problem on the right, both of which are a lot smaller. And so rather than having something that's exponentially hard, we can have a kind of divide and conquer algorithm for performing this sum. So this is an example, essentially, of dynamic programming. And, this, uh, and in HMMs, this is called the forward-backward algorithm, if you've, if you've encountered that before. It's also called belief propagation, as well as in the context of, of factor graphs, uh, it's called the sum product algorithm. So here's some more math that you don't need to remember too much uh, or at all. But the point is that there are, there are messages that we're going to pass essentially on the edges of this graph. And there's going to be a kind of message called a sum message that, uh, that we pass from, uh, uh, that we're going to uh, pass between factor nodes and these variable nodes, and then another kind of message called a product message that goes the other direction. And the idea is that these messages are sort of summarizing a state of the graph. And then when we combine these together, it's giving us an overall estimate of this, uh, of the kind of the, uh, it's giving us a, a local marginal that is summarizing uh, sort of everything we know. So this is an example, as I said, of essentially dynamic programming to perform this sum. So now, let's talk about uh, chemistry for just a second. So our, uh, our, what we're going to do is implement that kind of message passing, that kind of sum product algorithm, in chemical reaction networks. And a chemical reaction network 
is a, uh, a set of reactions de uh, defined over a set of, say, M chemical species. And then we have a set of triplets. And these triplets are integer coefficients associated with the reactants and integer coefficients associated with the products and some rate. Okay, most of the time, these coefficients are zero because you tend to have sort of low order reactions. And, uh, but we can describe this kind of whole, uh, like a big collection of these with this collection of triplets. All right, so this is kind of chemistry 101 stuff. Uh, mass action kinetics is this very nice idea of, of taking a chemical reaction network and then turning that into differential equations on the concentrations. And so this is assuming sort of well mixing and, and sort of large copy numbers and so on. Um, notationally, I'm doing this kind of funny thing where I'm mixing, uh, I'm gonna use sans serifs to describe, uh, to describe um, uh, chemical species. And then I'm gonna use square brackets like chemists do to describe concentrations of those guys. And then uh, sort of in general Roman fonts are gonna be like the equivalent things but describing the vectors. Uh, the point is though that you could go from a chemical reaction uh, network to a bunch of differential equations. And uh, these differential equations, just as a side note, are really fun uh, because the dynamics of mass action kinetics is actually almost exactly the multinomial distribution. So you can sort of think of these differential equations as asking the question, you know, with what probability, if I were to reach into my bag of molecules, what's the probability that I would draw out exactly the right set for the, uh, for the reaction to proceed? So exactly the kind of the right uh, sort of the, exactly the right set like, um, uh, of the reactants, right, to produce those products. Uh, and so you can, if you look at the sort of differential equations of mass action kinetics, you will see essentially something that looks exactly like uh, uh, the multinomial distribution. Anyway, I just thought that was fun. Um, the point is what we're gonna do now is take those differential equations that we get from uh, mass action kinetics and we're gonna to try to engineer a set of chemical reactions and a set of chemical species such that as those, as those uh, sort of, as we simulate those differential equations, as this system evolves, it will perform inference for us. So the, what we're gonna do is we're going to take sort of every element of every vector in this big graphical model and we're going to give it its own chemical species. And they're gonna be little groups of them. So if you have a discrete, if you have a, uh, a discrete random variable, and say it has five outcomes, then it's going to have five little chemical species. Okay, and, and the ratios of those guys are gonna represent uh, the marginal probability essentially of that, uh, of that random variable. And we're also going to have this idea of a recycling species. Essentially what we're gonna be doing, the way this is gonna work, is we're going to be constantly sort of decaying these belief species and then reallocating this, uh, excuse me, this kind of null species to all of the different, um, to all of the different possible outcomes. And we're gonna be catalyzing those according, that reallocation according to what essentially are the incoming messages. All right, so the, uh, um, so that sounds kind of like a weird thing, so let me kind of show you a picture. So we have some factor graph, and then we have messages that are getting passed on this factor graph. And what we're gonna do is take every one of those messages and give it a little collection of chemical species, and we're gonna interpret the ratios of those chemical species as the probabilities that would be the, sort of in the vector of the message itself, and then we're gonna couple them together using the chemical reaction network. So there are three distinct types of species. I mentioned this, this sort of belief recycling reaction, which is constantly decaying the, uh, um, sort of constantly decaying these belief species, and then they are being reallocated according to some message reaction and product message reactions that map directly onto, uh, onto what we saw from belief propagation. And the punchline here is that if you set up a reaction where basically what you're doing is taking this null species, allocating it to the, um, uh, to each of the sort of belief, sort of components of this belief vector, and you're catalyzing it with the incoming product messages, and then you compute the differential equation and look at the steady state concentrations, it essentially matches exactly what the sum message was from that dynamic programming algorithm I showed you before. Okay, and the, and the key here is that the rate is also according to that, uh, that factor that's associating these, these guys. Similarly, if we do almost the exact same thing with the product messages, so if we take our product null species, and we allocate it to the different elements of the vector uh, catalyzed now by the sum messages, then we wind up with uh, a set of differential equations that, again, at steady state, looks exactly like the product messages. So, so, so this is weird almost because it's, it's like almost too easy, actually. Uh, 
We're using probabilities to, to uh, we're using concentrations to represent these probabilities, and with a relatively simple and intuitive set of, of chemical reactions, we can implement something that will settle into the same solution we would get from marginalization. And this works because the, the, the um, essentially because the dynamic programming you do in belief propagation is exactly uh, a fixed point operator. It is a fixed point operator that you're applying to the state of this thing that's minimizing the beta free energy. So we can understand it as a minimization. So we can uh, take an arbitrary, the point is we can take a graph, uh, and if it's tree structured, uh, we'll get, we'll sort of converge to the, uh, to the right answer, and we can construct a set, of, uh, a set of reactions, and then for example, we can, we can simulate these and see that we actually get the marginals that we would expect if we had run uh, belief propagation on the, uh, sort of on this thing analytically. There's a knob that you get to turn, which is essentially the rate of, the, uh, of that recycling reaction. And if you turn that rate up, the answers become more approximate, but you get them faster. If you turn that down, it settles more slowly, but you get a more exact final state. This more or less boils down to, at steady state, how much of your sort of probability mass is encoded into these null species. This is interesting more broadly because it turns out you can also take these ideas and generalize them to things like the max product algorithm which allows you to do sort of map inference in graphical models. And, uh, and as I mentioned before, a lot of important error correcting codes and things are implemented in this kind of idea uh, with things like graphical models. So there's this sort of possibility of in doing some interesting error correction, and we've already found ways to build, for example, sort of ro more robust logic circuits, essentially where you have graphical model subcomponents. So it's a little bit crazy, right? But, but I think it's kind of a fun example of how we might take things like biomolecules and implement, uh, implement machine learning, and then ha it has this kind of surprising, and then it, it, the fact that it turns out to be surprisingly easy, I think is kind of, is kind of interestingly intriguing for, uh, for thinking about natural systems. That's massively speculative because we're, we're in a high copy number regime, well mixed, like there's are reasons why cells aren't doing this. Um, but as I said, it's kind of, it's kind of interestingly simple. Um, even if it didn't seem that way because I just threw a lot of math at you. Uh, but it's, it's I find it surprising that probabilities kind of see, uh, that concentrations seem to kind of want to implement probabilities. So sort of to summarize, I mean, this is an incredibly exciting time at the interface between uh, machine learning and the, and the life sciences. I think we're just gonna see, we're just seeing the start of this actually. And uh, you know, the effort that's being built here at the Broad, I think is, is kind of a harbinger of, of much greater things to come as, uh, as sort of uh, we, we learn how to negotiate these kinds of collaborations between uh, computer science and statistics and, and biology. Um, you know, it is tempting when we think about these, uh, this relationship for, to sort of focus it on, you know, hey, would you please analyze my data for me? Uh, but I really would like us to think, to think bigger and to think more broadly about these interfaces. Uh, in particular, ideas like trying to close the loop on design of these systems and also sort of trying to ask deep questions uh, about what we can learn from signal processing or uh, sort of using machine learning and, um, and using things like biomolecular systems. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot for having me and listening.